It's time, it is time, it is time. Welcome, my beautiful family, to Sunday night service. Listen, I have to talk to y'all for a second. I have to talk to you guys for a second. First off, I want to say thank you. I am truly, every Thursday night, blown away by what God is doing. And, and I'm, I, I pray that my life is just confirmation to somebody. Whatever it is that you're hesitant about, whatever it is that you're in doubt about, that God has constantly been urging you to do, there's just this constant gnawing in your soul. Write it, start it, produce it, birth it, say it, what, whatever it is, be obedient to God. Because I just remember so clearly in November of 2019 saying that nobody's gonna come to a Thursday night service and each and every week there's more people and more people and people are flying in every week. Somebody from Detroit and somebody from New York and I'm just, I'm just in awe of what God will do when you give him your yes. I know, I know I say that a lot, but I'm not just saying that to sound preachy. I'm serious, give God the how and he will give you his wow. Whatever it is, you keep on saying, but how am I going to do this? But God, how am I going to do that? And how am I going to... Next Sunday, I can't wait because my wife and I are ministering together. And we're doing a message um, entitled, God, Is This You? And in that message, we're already working on it. In that message, um, I begin to reveal how do you know God's voice from the enemy's voice from your voice. And the thing I say about God, God always, when it's God's voice, he tells you to do something that does not make logical sense. He tells you to do something that you don't know how this could turn out. He tells you to do something that you could fail and it would be embarrassing. That's how, that's like one of the main signs that you know that God is calling you to something. Because remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. And so naturally, when it looks bad, naturally, when it looks like it doesn't work, naturally, when it looks like nobody will subscribe, those are all signs. Those are all signs that God is possibly calling you to do something. So um, I wanted to come on for a few moments. Usually I get straight to the message, but I want to reveal to you my heart. Um, this discernment series is not just changing perfectly your life, it is changing mine. God is speaking so profoundly to me, and, and I don't say that lightly, he's speaking so profoundly to me each and every week about how we have discernment. When it was my brother um, Isaac on how to identify the devil has sent a counterfeit, and then part two of this series, needed discernment, then part three, cloudy judgment, um, and, and then we talked about can you discern a miracle and how God was really starting to reveal to us that the reason a lot of us, our discernment is so low is because you're ungrateful. An ungrateful heart will always become a desperate heart, and just week after week, the series is just, just blowing my mind. And um, right before we reopened, God asked me a question. Jerry, what is your definition of success of ministry? At the end of it all, and why you do what you do, define success of ministry. And I'm telling you, that has just been, I've been just pregnant with that question, just walking around with that question. What is your, what is your definition of success of ministry? And um, before service, before we start preparing everything for service on today, um, and last night I was beginning to pray and it came to me, like I think this is my definition of success of ministry. To serve people into the love of Jesus until that love displays Jesus. That is my lifelong calling. Serve people into the love of Jesus until that love displays Jesus. And I'm like, God, would you let that be my heart forever? So it's not about follows, it's not about likes, it's not about uh, subscriptions, it's not about shares, all that stuff is great, but ultimately, my goal is to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And the only way I can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, is I have to do something well, I have to finish it, I have to be faithful, and I have to serve. And so, I just wanted you to hear my heart before we go to the message on tonight. I truly, like for real, I truly get the most fulfillment and the most honor to serve you 
each and every week. It is my honor and I get so I get so grateful when I get so many messages that are saying I'm growing and I'm changing and I've returned back to Christ or I gave my life to Christ. That means so much to me because that is my life calling. And on tonight, I want you to check out this message because it's just a perfect follow-up from the message that we just did. That's not what friends do. Wasn't that crazy? <laughs> that message was fire, like for real, for real. But I believe it's a, a perfect follow-up because if I'm going to be able to identify what friends don't do, and if I'm going to understand what a biblical friend is, my heart has to be healthy. Some of us, your heart is so wounded, that's why you can't discern. A wounded heart will be limited in its discernment ability. And I need heart management. I need my heart to be trained. I need my heart to be healed. Because when my heart is not trained, nor is my heart healed, I will keep on picking what was familiar. Because <laughs> my heart doesn't know any better, so it needs to be trained. So I really pray that this message blesses you. I just want to come on and encourage somebody and let you know I love you so much. And it is an honor to serve you. Let's get to this message. Yes. What is up, family? I hope that you guys are excited. So go ahead and tag somebody, tag a friend. Uh, share this for me so that this service can get with and touch somebody and I'm just loving all of your support All of your likes all of your love. Thank you guys so much. It is an honor to serve you week after week take a screenshot Tag us Let us know where you are in the world last week. We have people from Singapore. We have people from South Korea We have people all over America. We have people from Brazil. We have people from Brussels We have people from London. We have people from the Netherlands We have people from Australia all over the world and I believe that God is doing it because he loves his people And I'm just a vessel nothing special <laughs> So let's get to work our foundational text one verse it comes from Songs of Solomon, depending on your, your Bible, it may be Songs of Songs. But Songs of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 4, it says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. The exact same verse in the exact same chapter, just from a different version. This is from the Message Bible. Verse 4, it says, Oh, let me warn you, sisters in Jerusalem, don't excite love. Don't stir it up until the time is ripe and you're ready. This particular passage of scripture reveals to us a truth that many have not digested. This, this particular passage of scripture can greatly serve us in the area of our soul care, of our soul care and mental clarity. And it serves us with this truth. There is a time, a time. Can I get somebody put in the room? A time, a time. There is a time and it's not when your biological clock is ticking, it's not when you get butterflies in your stomach because the way some of these dudes are set up today, they don't even like give out butterflies. The way that some of these women are today, they don't even give out butterflies no more. It's more like mosquitoes. Just biting and just sucking the life out of you. Just parasitic. Not when your biological clock is ticking. Not when you feel like you're ready. Not when it's cold outside and now you want to bay. Because it is better, please hear me, it is better to have a cold bed with peace than it is to be kept warm by a real devil. <laughs> this passage lets us know that A, there is a time, and B, can you identify when you're ready. So God, we are in high expectation of what you're going to do. I thank you that you anoint me as your PA system, as your oracle, as your spokesman, and as your representative to use these words to touch the hearts of your people. We're asking that you do it. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you drop in the room, amen. Amen. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you to do not awaken or stir up 
love until it pleases. I want to just get to work on the night. I would like to speak around this thought from this subject. Don't wake love before it's time. <laughs> Don't wake love before it's time. I believe firmly that this message applies to everybody because there are people who are married who weren't ready. And now they're trying to figure out how do I love this person when I ended up in a covenant with you and I wasn't even ready yet. So like I said, each week I'm going to have us say a declaration, a decree over your life. Can I get everybody, everybody under the sound of my voice to drop this in the room? I'm trying to make this virtual personal. So I'm telling you a lot. You do not have the right to remain silent. You are going to participate for the time that we have together on tonight. Can I get you to drop in the room? Lord, prepare me for what's mine and keep me from what's not. One more time. Lord, Prepare me for what's mine and keep me from what is not. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there is a problematic and deleterious issue that's being unaddressed. It's low on the radar, but it is a contributor to our heartaches, to our headaches, to our insomnia, to our tears, to our prolonged seasons and to our trauma, and that is the lack of training, instruction, and education in the area of heart management. That was a lot, so I'm gonna say it again. There is this problematic and deleterious issue that is greatly affecting us, and it is a low on the radar discussion, but it is a contributor to our heartaches headaches, depression, anxiety, insomnia, prolonged seasons, and trauma, and that is the lack of training and education in the area of heart management. See, if you want to be a barber, you go to barber school. If, if you want to be a lawyer, you go to law school and you have to pass the bar exam. If, if you want to be a doctor, you go to med school. But where do you go if you want to be in love? See, <laughs> see, relationships are the only area. Relationships are the only area we treat as though we don't need to be educated. I'm talking about fourth and fifth graders are talking about they have a boyfriend and they have a girlfriend. And in some cases, people are having sex as early as elementary school. I'm like, when I was growing up, it was called puppy love. Now they just have like full grown German Shepherd, Great Dane, Pitbull, Red Nose Pitbull, Rock Walla Love. This is not puppy anymore. This is not puppy anymore. And we have, we have a lot of high school students that join us every Thursday night that watch. There's somebody watching this right now who is in high school. And you swear you love this boy. And you swear you love this girl. And since we're in a pandemic and most of our classes are virtual, you log on for your virtual algebra class. You log on for your virtual geometry class. You log on for your virtual history class. But where do you log on to get heart management education? Before you caught feelings for him, before you caught feelings for her, where did you go to get education, to get training, and to get insight? See, please hear me, please hear me. This is how we have wives who don't know how to be wives. This is how we have husbands who don't know how to be husbands. This is how we have mothers who don't know how to be mothers. This is how we have fathers who don't know how to be fathers because we have not understood that love requires skill. Relationships require skill. Healthy Kingdom relationships require skill. It requires skill. This is how somebody has God in their bio, but they don't have God in their life. Oh, Lord. This is how somebody has God in their bio, but they don't have God in their life because they have never been trained. They have never been discipled. And there is nothing more cancerous to the body. Please hear me on the night. There is nothing more cancerous to the body than when we have the undiscipled making disciples. Preach Holy Spirit. There is nothing more damaging to the body than when we have the undiscipled trying to make disciples or when we have people preaching bad doctrine. 
Because what will end up happening is a lot of people will get frustrated with God and will walk away from the faith because you tried to implement some spiritual discipline without being discipled and educated about what you're really doing. So you trying to fast and you fasting for a house. You're fasting for a car, you're fasting for a race, you're fasting for a husband, you're fasting for a wife, but that's not even biblical. In the Bible, we don't fast for things. We fast for repentance, not remorse. Repentance, meaning I turn away from something. We fast for repentance or we fast to turn down the volume of your flesh. So if you're fasting, but you're still cursing people out, you fasting, but you're still gossiping, you fasting, but you still mean, go on, eat. <laughs> Just go ahead and eat. Go ahead and eat. This is how people get frustrated. And they walk away from the faith because they don't see the results in this area. It's because we have not been properly trained. Please hear me on the night. The heart must be converted. The heart must be regenerated. The heart must be trained. The heart must be taught. The heart must be developed enough to even have the capacity to extend love because love requires selflessness. Love requires sacrifice and selflessness and sacrifice goes against the very makeup of our humanity. It's not natural. This, this is how we have two-year-olds and three-year-olds coming into the world and one of their favorite words is mine. Mine. My toy, my bottle, my pacifier, my shoe, my object, my pad, mine, mine, mine. And unfortunately, we have people now who are 32, 42, my God, 52, 62, and they're still, and they're still talking like they're two. 62, and they're still talking like they're two. Mine, my money, my wealth. My feelings, my thoughts, my desires, my way, my things, my house, my life. And one of the signs that you're not ready for love is when you have not outgrown toddler language. Woo! One of the signs that you are not ready, that you're not ready for love is when you have not outgrown toddler language. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when I was a child, I'm trying so hard to stay calm y'all. When I was a child, I talked as a child. I thought as a child. I reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, see this is why I said in the series, this is why I said in the series, a male is a state of birth, but being a man is a matter of choice. It's the same thing for you ladies. Being a female is a state of birth, but being a woman is a matter of choice. And one of the signs that you have matured is when you have put off childishness. You have put off being petty. You have put off holding a record of wrongs. You have put off arrogance. You have put off yelling. Why are you yelling, bro? <laughs> Why are you yelling? It, it, it's the rain that grows the flowers, not the thunder. And you will always experience frustration. Frustration is imminent whenever the emotionally underaged and the spiritually mature attempt to do life together. Did you guys hear what I just said? You will always experience frustration. And frustration is imminent whenever the emotionally underaged and the spiritually mature attempt to do life together. Gosh, because you don't catch health. You catch sickness. You are not going to arrive at this awesome, holistic, kingdom, powerful, anointed version of yourself on accident. And the reason I'm doing this series is because I wish I had this. I wish when I was 21, in college, struggling, 
struggling, trying to figure out, am I going to serve Jesus or am I going to be like my friends? Am I going to be like the culture? Am I going to be like my peers? When I was struggling and questioning my salvation because I had a struggle with pornography, if I was able to log on and to hear a message say, listen, you're having withdrawals. This is what happens when toxicity leaves the body. This is not a question of your salvation. This is you need to be discipled. Your heart has to be converted and you need to be trained. You need to be trained. So somebody's going to come up, come out of a lifestyle of living in the street, come out of a lifestyle of godlessness, and then you expect them to be godly after the first time they accepted Christ. They need training. We need training. I wish I had content like this that would let me know that the outcome of your relational sanity, the outcome of your relational sanity is tied to your heart being trained. So this is why I'm doing this, to serve anybody else who may struggle in this particular area. See, please hear me. The greatest difficulty before conversion is to win the heart to God. But the greatest difficulty after conversion is to keep the heart with God. If you a note take, I need you to write that down. The greatest difficulty before conversion is to win the heart to God. But the greatest difficulty after conversion is to keep the heart with God. I need heart conversion. I need somebody to train me about what love really is. I need heart management. See, listen, the word management in itself preaches. If you were to dissect and break down the word management, drop off the N and T, you get manage me. So what we're supposed to do is manage our heart. But for most of us, our heart has managed us. Our heart has managed to cause us to fall for somebody who had no intentions of catching you. Never allow the heart to run management. Our heart has managed to get us to entertain and love a manipulator. Love a manipulator or a narcissistic individual who blames you for their behavior because it is easier to blame you than it is to change themselves. Never allow the heart to run management. The heart has led us into trying to force, into trying to force a relationship to work when it's obvious that we're on two different levels. Who am I talking to? Has your heart ever tried to force you to see beyond the reality and only see the potential? Your heart has tried to force you to make something work. Listen, when it's forced, it's you. When it flows, it's God. When it's forced, it's you. When it flows, it's God. Even a rock in the middle of a stream cannot stop the flow. I'm not saying that you won't have difficulties. I am saying that it won't stop the flow. I'm not saying that you won't have a log of disappointment, but I am saying it won't stop the flow. I'm not saying that you won't have a waterfall of letdowns, but I am saying it won't stop the flow. I'm not saying that you won't have a waterfall of layoffs or a waterfall of financial surprises, but I am saying it won't stop the flow. When it's God, there's just a flow. There's an unspeakable flow, a flow of confirmation, a flow of clarity, a flow of joy. That does not mean things won't happen that will try to disrupt the flow, but they won't be able to stop the flow. Can I get somebody to drop in the room? Flow, 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 flow. When it's you, it's forced. When it's God, it flows. And so the question on the floor that I have for you is, what are you trying to force to flow? Yeah, I feel like that just grabs somebody all by the neck. What are you trying to force to flow? Because when it's forced, it's you. When it flows, it's God. Never allow the heart to run management. See, a giraffe and a fish will never be friends. Never be friends. I want y'all to look at this. Look how massive of a beautiful creature the giraffe is. Now look at the fish. <laughs> look, look, look 
at the fish. See, the giraffe and the fish will never be friends because we eat on two different levels. We eat on two different levels. I'm eating up here, but you're a bottom feeder. Lord have mercy. A giraffe and a fish will never be friends because they see on two different levels. Even in the shallow end, you'll drown trying to have a conversation with them. What are you trying to force to flow? Never allow the heart to run management. See, the heart for many of us is trying to force acceptance. You're trying to get people to accept you. But here's the thing, the slavery of acceptance Please notice, I said slavery. The slavery of acceptance will cause for you to hide your wings and apologize for attempting to fly. And people who are slaves to acceptance usually wear masks. That means they're fake. A lot of us were wearing masks way before COVID. <laughs> Listen, and, and the dangerous thing of being surrounded with people who wear masks, meaning who don't live authentic lives, because they're so caught up with other people's acceptance, the dangerous thing of surrounding yourself with people who wear masks is you'll end up in the Mardi Gras of artificial and you'll exchange your authenticity for the beads of their acceptance. Lord have mercy. You'll exchange your authenticity for the beads of their acceptance. Never allow the heart to run management. For many of us, our heart has managed for us to entertain an individual who made the erroneous assumption that our insecurities mean that you could talk to me disrespectful, that you could be mentally and verbally and physically abusive, and our loneliness allowed it. Our loneliness allowed it. This is why I'm preaching so hard, because I'm trying to get us to understand that your insecurities are exposed by how you pick. And a lot of us are picking ponds when you have been built for oceans. I'm doing this series because I'm trying to get you to understand that you have a call on your life. I'm doing this, doing this series to try to get you to understand that your birth was not an accident. You might have been a shock to your parents, but you were right on time for God. God looked in the earth and he saw a problem and then he thought about you. So then he allowed your mama to meet your daddy. I don't know how the circumstances went down, but that was a transportational system that God used to get you here in the earth because there is a problem. If you are bored, this means you have allowed your gifts to go to sleep. I'm trying to stay calm, y'all. Anytime we are bored, it is because we've allowed our gifts to go to sleep. God cosmically created you because there's a problem here in the earth that you have to solve. That is purpose. Purpose is a fixer. And there's a problem that you have to solve. And maybe the reason that you are so bored is because there's a problem that you're not fixing. There's a problem that you are not fixing. Never allow the heart to run management. Can I get everybody to say that? Never allow the heart to run management. There's a famine of a conversation when it comes to the need of heart conversion. There's a famine of the conversation of just because you like him does not mean your heart knows how to extend love. Just because you like her does not mean your heart knows how to extend love. I need to be discipled and I need to be trained. The second sign that you may not be ready or that you should possibly not stir or awaken love is when, we, is when you follow your heart. I feel like this truth right here is messing somebody up. You, you don't Follow your heart. Sometimes the truth is so hard to receive because we haven't identified what lie is holding us hostage. You, you don't follow your heart. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17 that the heart is deceitfully wicked. 
Who can know it? So when you follow your heart, it can deceive you and lead you into wicked places. We don't just adopt cultural sayings because it's common. You don't follow your heart. You lead your heart. Like I said, the hardest part of conversion is to keep a heart with God, is to make sure my heart is not drifting, is to make sure my Bible is not dusty, is to make sure my prayer closet isn't collecting dust, is to make sure I'm constantly challenging myself to have my heart in the hand of God instead of my heart in the hand of my will. I need training. I need training and I need discipleship and I need to stop adopting cultural sayings. Here's another one. Love shouldn't hurt. That's a lie. Of course, I'm not talking about abuse or violence or anything like that. That's not love. That's manipulation and narcissism. But love shouldn't hurt. If that was true, explain the cross. I'll wait. I'll wait, though. Like, I'll really wait. <laughs> if, if love shouldn't hurt, explain the cross. Oh, it's, it's, it's going to hurt for you to love like a king loves. Matter of fact, if love doesn't hurt, you're not loving right. Woo! Boy. <laughs> if love doesn't hurt, you're not loving right. Because it's going to hurt to deny your flesh. It's going to hurt for you to bite your tongue. Here we go. It's going to hurt for you not to hold a record of wrongs. It's going to hurt for your, it's going to hurt your flesh for you not to be petty and to keep score. And so the next time they try to correct you, you have so much tea in your pitcher. You have so much ammunition in your barrel of clapback that you're just going to fire back at them because it takes work to let people make it. It's painful to bite my tongue, but it is about maturity. That's it. That's it. That's the goal. It is about me wanting to be mature. It is about me being mature enough to mentally respond versus emotionally react. Now, if there's anybody watching this message where you don't desire maturity and you're not embracing spiritual puberty, don't wake up, don't stir, don't shake, and don't bother love until you have got to the place to where I desire maturity more than the pleasure of being petty. Who is that for? <laughs> See, the heart is used in scripture as the most comprehensive term of the authentic person. It is, it is the part of our being where we decide, where we feel, and our desires. It is our conscious self of spiritual activity. In layman's terms, this is the part of you that feels, that thinks, that desires, that craves, that has passions. Your heart is your control center. And the lifelong warfare is to make sure that the Holy Spirit and that the Word of God run management. This is so good. That is your heart. Your heart is your control center. It is your control center and the warfare of our life is to make sure that we allow the Holy Spirit to be the CEO and the word of God to be the captain of our control center, of our heart, so that we can have hearts that are constantly turning to do the will of God. My heart is turned towards God because when we are born, it's like we are born with a bad will alignment. Our hearts naturally just drift towards evil. If you let the will go, it'll just drift to go back to porn. If you let the will go, it'll just drift to go back to lesbianism. If you just let the will go, and when I mean let the will go, I mean if you just stop praying, if you just stop logging on, feasting on the word of God with me or any other spiritual leader, if you just stop having devotion, if you just stop being held accountable, as soon as you let go of your spiritual will, your heart would drift because we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So, so I, I want you to see this. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart for everything, not some things, but for everything you do flows from it. See, and I think a lot of times we don't know the difference between walling our heart and guarding your heart. So we'll say things like, see, this is why I don't talk to anybody, bro. 
That, that's why I don't talk. <laughs> People can't handle your stuff. That's why I never talk to anybody. I keep everything within. You gotta guard your heart. That's not guarding your heart. That's walling your heart. A wall is when you can't get out and no one could get in. And many times we have walled our hearts due to pain being a waiter who served us the appetizer of fear. Pain being a waiter who has served us the appetite of fear. And fear will keep you on the shore without you ever realizing that you could swim. Because I fear experiencing that same pain from that last marriage, from that last relationship, from what I went through there, from what happened at that church, I'm done with church, I'm done with people, I'm not doing relationships, I'm good, I gotta guard my heart. That's not guarding your heart. That is walling your heart. This is why I said my desire for this particular series, if you check out every single message, my desire is for you to heal to such a degree that when love knocks on the door of your heart, fear won't cause for you to act like you're not home. Because pain is a waiter who serves you the appetizer of fear. And because of what you went through, because of how painful that was, because of how that hurt you, because of how you cried, because you couldn't believe anybody could be this evil, because of the pain you felt, you have walled your heart. And you're so cut off from people, you don't really talk to people, you're not, see some people, you're mislabeling it. You're not really an introvert, you're into hurt. Sometimes you are introvert, that's just how you are, that's how you've been your whole life. But for others of us, you're not really an introvert, you're into hurt. There has been some pain that hit your heart that you're like, I'm never going to feel that again. I will never go through that again. And so you have walled your heart. But the Bible says, guard your heart. So what is a guard? I want you to think coast guard, security guard, national guard. A guard's job is to protect. Guards screen and evaluate. Guards screen and evaluate. <laughs> Those sound effects though. Guards screen and evaluate. And after gathering information, after further review, the guard will decide access granted or access denied. And a lot of us haven't learned, nor have we been trained to guard our heart means access granted or access denied. Not access denied to everybody. Because if access is denied to everybody, access is also denied to you too. Because you don't have a guard, you have a wall. Above all else, guard your heart. Now look at this. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart. Whoa! Will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Hmm. So this text is letting me know right here. You want to know how to guard your heart? The peace of God guards your heart. I'm right in the text. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart. So you're like, okay, um, I, I, need to, I need you to break that down a little bit for me. Like, how, how does that look? How do I actually have peace, the peace of God, guard my heart? I'm glad you asked. We just go to the word. Look at verse 6. It says, be anxious for nothing. There it is. One of the way you guard your heart is you've got to deal with your anxiety. We have to deal with anxiety because anxiety is a robber. And so the word is saying, be anxious for nothing because anxiety is a robber and it will cause you to entertain counterfeits because you're viewing the place that you're at or your singleness as a prison. And so anybody who takes interest in you or any offer that seems to give you more money, but you don't know the calorie count behind the ice cream and sprinkles and whipped cream, anything that, <laughs> anything that seems to get you out of this prison will be seen as a bail bond. So when you view your singleness as a prison, a counterfeit, you'll be attracted to because you view them as a bail bond. I just got to get out of here. I just want to get out of this. I just want to be free. And so the word of God is saying, listen, what we do is we don't, we're not anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But look, but in everything by prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is just communication with God. So don't be anxious. When you feel anxious, pray. The more anxious I am, the less I have been conversing with I am. 
But the more I have been conversing with I am, the less anxious I am. God, I hope you're getting this. But in everything by prayer and supplication. A lot of us just breeze past that. A prayer of supplication means an earnest request, beg, or plea. Now, if we break down the word supplication, the root word is supply. So it's saying, okay, this is a prayer why I'm earnestly making a request to the one who handles my supplies. You are the only one, Yahweh, who can supply me in this area. You are the only one, Yahweh, who can supply me with everything I need. So I'm not going to be anxious. I'm going to have conversations with God because he is the only one that can supply me in the area of my loneliness, that can supply me in the area of my depression, that can supply me in the area of my worry, that can supply me in the, in the area of my doubt. He is the only one who can supply. And then the word says, with thanksgiving. This is so good, y'all. This is so good. It's like, okay, this is what you got to do. You got to be thankful because the way you think will dictate how you think. And I, I really have had to do this. There have been times where I have woken up just feeling some type of way. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. You ever just woke up and you just, you just kind of in a mood. If you haven't, praise God. But sometimes you just wake up, you irritated, you don't really know why. And I had to eat my own words. Jerry, the way you think would dictate how you think. So I begin to thank God that I can just go to the refrigerator and eat breakfast. I thank God that I could brush my teeth on my own strength because somebody can't do it. I thank God that I have a vehicle that I can get to point A to point B. It's not the flies of vehicles, but it is transportation because somebody doesn't have it. And if you don't have transportation, at least you have feet. I had to thank him for my health and my strength. And I begin to notice, y'all, the more I thank, it started to bleed over into how I think. And if you start to think on all the things that you could be thankful for, then your thankfulness will start to affect the way you're thinking. So now I'm not really anxious and now I'm not really tripping because I'm thinking. And because I'm thinking, it's starting to bleed over into how I'm thinking. And y'all seeing this, we don't need thanksgiving to get here for us to pray prayers of thanksgiving. Anytime you want to get out of a funk, anytime you want to get out of a mood, anytime you want to get out of a vibe, you just have to start thanking. I thank you for my health and strength. I thank you for my mind. I thank you for my clarity. I thank you for my job. I thank you that you're providing for me even if I don't have a job. I thank you for this word. I thank you for this ministry. I thank you for my children. I thank you for my spouse. The way you thank will bleed over into how you think and the way you think will start to bleed over in how you think be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to God this is a heart issue that's what this is about don't wait love before it's time what we're, all, what we're talking about is don't wait love until you have a heart that desires maturity. Because the heart is our appetite. When Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, hunger translated from Hebrew is famished. So he's really saying, blessed are those who are famished. Blessed are those who are desperately hungry, for they will be filled. Because there are levels to hunger. You could be so hungry... <laughs> That you're desperate. Being hungry. Being hungry is a sign of health. What if I told you that hunger is a sign of health? Where concern is heightened is when we have lost our appetite. Because the way God has wired us is for us to have a trigger that causes for us to be hungry, which means I need to fuel up. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is what type of fuel do you put in your heart? Are you like most drivers? You pull over and you just select the cheapest gas. Isn't it crazy that we want a supreme blessing, but we keep on doing regular things? I hope y'all caught that. And then we wonder why we feel we're in a shell.
I wonder, is there anybody who has arrived at this place? Jerry, I don't want just supreme. I want diesel. I want diesel anointing. I want diesel understanding. I want a diesel worship life. I don't want just a regular. That's cheap. <laughs> I want, God, I want the stuff you got in the back. I want the stuff you got in the back. I want the stuff that only those who are hungry for it get. That's what I want. God wants our heart. He wants our heart because the only way we could ever get over principalities is if we follow principles. And a lot of us, our heart has never received healthy, holistic principles. It has not been trained. And so we have strongholds in our heart. What is a stronghold? It's anything in your life that has a strong hold. A stronghold is not a devil or a demon, but it is a place where devils and demons can work from. In military terms, a stronghold is a fortress. It is a defensive place. It is where soldiers gather to defend a kingdom. So whenever there is a stronghold present in my life or a stronghold present in your life, it is an area where the enemy defends to maintain his grip. This is so powerful, y'all. This is how a lot of people are extremely defensive. This is why the enemy wants you to move yourself away from people who love you. Because he knows that love conquers all. And when you love somebody, you tell them the truth. And the truth shall set you, oh, y'all got it. The truth shall set you free. So if I'm surrounded by people who love me enough to tell me the truth, if I'm surrounded by people who tell me, baby girl, you don't know how to love. Bro, you don't know how to love. Your heart needs to be trained. Your heart needs to be discipled. Your heart needs to be converted. Your heart needs to be regenerated. If I don't have people handing me the truth, this allows the enemy to maintain his grip. So number one, how do we get to a place to where I'm ready for love? It's when you have a naked heart. No secrets. If you're entering into a relational context, my wife and I, when we first started courting and dating, we would start off early with what we call ugly nights. All the ugliness. The ugliness about yourself, the things you're ashamed of, if you've been molested, have you been, you know, uh, abused. Let's deal with all the ugliness. Somebody may be like, listen, I ain't telling anybody all that. Or you may feel as though uh, that might scare them off. You can never detour what is yours. I just firmly believe what God has for you is for you. And for men, if we find out about your dirt, kingdom men have a minor's work ethic. Yeah, there's a lot of dirt, but we just believe there's gold under this. You cannot detour what God has for you, a naked heart. Open with my failures, open with my insecurities. And if they can't handle it, they weren't the one assigned to help you unpack. Naked heart. Because what a lot of people are dealing with in marriage is they had dressed hearts. And now when they're in covenant, they're naked. And now it's like, I don't even know this person. Naked heart. Accountability requires nudity. Number two, a reconstructed heart. God, I need you to reconstruct me. Make me your construction site. Wreck the walls of my truths that are really lies. Help me identify what lies holding me hostage. Help me forgive those. Help me forgive those that have done me wrong circumcision of the heart. I need you to reconstruct my heart. And number three, God, mold my heart. A molded heart. God wants us to have hearts that are like the clay after the rain. I can mold it and shape it and form it. And if we don't allow the water of God's word, see, this is why it's so powerful to receive the water of God's word. Because dirt that does not have water gets hard. It gets hard. But dirt that has water added to it can mold. This is why we read the word every day. This is why I read the word every night. This is why you're getting this word on tonight. God is trying to add water to your heart because I got to mold it. I got to shape it. I got to form it. And lastly, now I can have a loving heart. And this is paramount because this is a kingdom agenda. By this, all men 
will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. So God, would you educate us? Would you give us a regenerated heart, a heart of conversion? Because God, we recognize we're not going to arrive to this healthy, holistic place on accident, but it's going to take intentionality. Help us to be intentional with, ne with our nakedness. Help us to be intentional, God, with, with allowing you to mold us. Help us to be intentional with getting the living water in our lives so our hearts can be moldable like clay after a fresh spring rain. Because it is our desire, God, to make you look good because you are good and we just want to be a billboard we want to be an arrow that points to you forgive us of all the times we tried to force things without getting your counsel and help us to forgive ourselves for all the things insecurity allowed us to do and our ignorance caused us to do but help us to be an educated people because we need heart conversion we need heart management. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Wow. God, God, would you would you give me a naked heart? Would you reconstruct my heart? Would you mold my heart? Because it is your will that I have a loving heart. One of our core values here at our local ministry is love is our DNA. Love is our DNA. You know, each and every week I keep on preaching. It is my desire to redeem the original kingdom agenda. That's one of my core values. And my second core value is love is our DNA. And what God wants to do in your life and what God wants to send to somebody's life. Watching this right now. What God wants to send to your life requires for your heart to be trained. So listen, thank you so much for joining us on tonight. Please share. Please tell somebody about this word. And then Thursday in person and online, I'm preaching from this message. That's not my problem because I need discernment when it comes to what is my assignment. And this could be the reason why you're so exhausted because you keep on fighting battles that aren't yours. So by the time you stand before the battle that is yours, you're exhausted. So listen, if you're watching this and you're like, you know what, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to start over. I heard all of this message. I got choked up. I start crying in the word and I want God to really save me. I want to give my life to the Lord. Would you please text the word fresh start to this number? Fresh start to this number and it will be my honor to let you know, hey, you made the best decision of your life by accepting Christ. And then also you're like, listen, this is my church home. I may live in Atlanta. I might live in Argentina, but this is my church home and this is where I grow and this is where I get edified. And you would like to officially join, text the word membership to the number below and also your giving. You guys have been absolutely amazing. Your giving is truly making a difference so that we could do more for the kingdom of God. Your seeds are making a difference. If you desire to give, all information is before you. It is my honor to serve you and I can't wait to see you on Thursday night, rather in person or online as we continue this discernment series. Have a wonderful night.